Cool. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today. Um, we hope it's going to be a really interesting, insightful uh, uh, webinar. Um, so what is the topic while we're here? Uh, we're going to be discussing the uh, payment life cycle in 2024. Um, and just click over here. Um, so I'm one of the co-hosts today. My name is Jared Fisher. I'm the head of product here at Kaleno. And uh, my role over here at Kaleno is to build some software that automates your financial operations, helps you get paid faster, streamline those workflows and payment reconciliation. Uh, so if you're keen to learn more, uh, send us a message after this demo. Uh, over to my co-host, Samak. Thanks, Jared. Nice to meet you, everyone. Really excited to be here today. I'm Samak Rezaizada, as you can see, and I lead product marketing and insights at GoCardless. For those who don't know, GoCardless um, is a payments provider, and we focus exclusively on bank payments. So that means really um, helping you collect your payments directly from your customers' bank accounts. So when you hear GoCardless, think bank payments and then think of us. Um, been here for about seven years, um, really kind of focusing on what is it our customers care about, why do they care about those things, and how best can we um, build a product that helps them um, uh, address those pains and problems. Um, yeah, so super excited um, to be here and, and keen to keen to get cracking. Um, Jordan, why don't you uh, give us a little intro? Thanks, CMAC. So my name is Jordan Hickson. I'm the Account Receivable Manager at DNA Payments. So I've been in sort of the payments industry for around about seven years. And for those that don't know, DNA Payments is a, an omnichannel payments company, which basically means we cater to all different kind of target areas on one platform. That's it from me. <laughs> cool. So what are we talking about today? What's the agenda? What are we going to cover? Um, there will be a Q&A at the end, so please do save your questions. Um, it's going to be a pretty informal uh, chat between us. Um, so there's not going to be hundreds of slides, but we're here to rather give you something interesting uh, to learn about. So the topics for today, uh, topic number one is the open banking and the impact on integrated payments. Uh, topic number two is the significance of having multiple payments options uh, in integrated systems. So like checkouts, et cetera, having multiple ways to pay. And uh, the last topic is the direct debits and their resurgence as a key payment method in 2024. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's jump into the first topic. Um, so the first topic at hand is open banking and its impact on integrated payments. And really our goal over here is to you know, teach you why you should be using open banking, what are the advantages, where is the technology going? Um, we hear about open banking all the time, um, but what does it actually mean? So Samak, first question for you, what are the primary benefits of uh, integrating open banking into your payment system for both the business and the consumer? Yeah, thanks, Jared. Um, I think maybe take a step back and, and go, you, um, what are the payment? What are the benefits of any payment system or any payment uh, method that we have? And and at Go Cardless, we actually developed a, a framework against which we could measure the different values of different payment methods based on a range of different needs that businesses ultimately have. I mean, for anyone interested, we call these the eight dimensions of payments. And if you want to kind of watch me doing a lovely long video talking about it, please feel free to search that online. And I'm not going to go into the whole framework now, but um, you know, to give you an example, one such dimension is coverage, right? So how many payers can you reach? Um, another dimension might be settlement. You know, how quickly do businesses actually receive money into their bank account? You know, things that people really, really care about when it comes to you know managing payments. Um, for businesses, um, when I think about open banking, at least from a payments perspective, there's a really good opportunity to to do the following. Right. Um, so number one, it's uh, a dimension we call cost. Um, so how do you uh, process payments? In a, in a way that's as cost effective as possible. And open banking payments gives you a really, really strong ability to do that. The value chains are lower. Effectively, you're enabling bank payment type cost dynamics. But, and here's the second bit, um, with really good confirmation. Um, so confirmation is an, or confirmation speed is another important payment dimension. If a payment goes through or if a payment doesn't go through, how quickly can you find out about that? Um, and with open banking payments, you get close to real time confirmation time, right? So if a payment goes through, you get told in real time um, that that payment has been successful or unsuccessful. So you get kind of really strong cost dynamics, but with the confirmation dynamics of a card, of a card payment, which would typically be more expensive. In addition, you, um, you, you get security by design to really, really enhanced fraud um, capabilities. Effectively, you know, you have to, uh, a payer has to log in and prove that they kind of own the bank account that they're using. Um, and then finally, 
settlement. Um, you know, you have the ability to actually get money in your bank um, in, you know, sometimes in real time, but up to, you know, up to a max of one day, right? So um, you can kind of got really good settlement dynamics, really good fraud dynamics, strong confirmation dynamics and low cost. Uh, and all that ends up with, what that means you end up with is, um, you know, the workhorse reliability of, you know, typical kind of bank payments. So high, uh, high payment success, low cost, great coverage in a country because everyone's got a bank account, but with the confirmation speed of cards as well. So you're kind of blending the best of, 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 of both worlds there. Uh, for payers, this might translate to more secure payments, a great user experience, and hopefully lower costs for them, leading to lower prices and, and more innovation. Uh, that, of course, is is the promise. Um, I think a lot of work needs to be done for that to become a reality. And you know, you've got banks, service providers, companies like Go Cardless, the wider eco ecosystem all need to work together to make that happen over the long term. It's, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but the, the the opportunity is there. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. And I think also like Smack, from our point of view, what open banking's allowed for businesses such as ourselves and like being in that startup environments is you know democratizing that access to information where traditionally, you know. The only people that had access to your bank feed outside of you, assuming you've given them authorization, were like big enterprises that have built those direct integrations into banks um, or those direct payment gateways. Like now, it allows startups such as ourselves that are growing um, very fast is to pull that bank feed information and, you know, make real time analysis and data impact. Um, I know Jordan uses that uh, daily. We often having chats about that. Um, and it's really it's been great for companies such as ourselves, you know, from both access to information, but also, you know, initiating those payments. Um, and Samak, I mean, you obviously go cardless, you know, across multiple continents. What, what are you guys seeing from a regulatory point of view? Like, you know, the whole EU versus UK, you know, uh, whether you're pro-Brexit or against, we, we're not trying to discuss that. But more from a point of view, you know, um, for example, when the UK was leaving Brexit, the whole thing was there's going to be less rules and regulations. Is that seen, something you've seen translate into open banking itself? Or like, where do we stand in the UK to the rest of the, you know, other markets out there, such as Australia and the, the EU? Yeah, I mean, so if you think about, op I mean, there are open banking initiatives happening um, in you know many countries across the world, right? And 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 you can kind of see different countries at different stages of their of their evolution. Um, the UK is, is has you know historically done really really well, um, driven primarily but primarily by regulation, kind of had a very fast start, um, you know, kind of you know, payments coming about a few years ago, and then kind of you know growing up to I think by last. Uh, the last I saw was something, you know, north of 12 million open banking payments every single month, I think back in kind of October time. Um, so, you know, has has done has done really, really well there. Um, but now at a real crunch point where, you know, regulation has gotten us to a certain point, um, uh, you know, a lot of the banks have been kind of forced to kind of build up to a certain standard, um, forced to open up um, that they're, they're kind of open up to kind of pay providers like Go Cardless and others. Um, uh, but now to get it that next if kind of a step further it needs to be real kind of the market needs to also be involved, right? Then it has to be commercial incentives for banks to be able to kind of make the right investment decisions to be able to kind of build the best possible user experience on the, on the consumer side and different places are, are outside the UK are at different stages of that as well. Right. So if you look at um, the EU across the EU um, through PSD two and, you know, upcoming in the next few years, hopefully PSD three um, will again, force some, some of this from a regulatory perspective, but of course you're looking at a much more complicated market, you know, thousands of banks instead of hundreds of banks. Um, and, and, you know, that means you're going to have got different standards across different banks and so on, which is just a lot more work. If again, if you look at a couple of the other places you mentioned, Australia, um, if anyone's here, here heard of the scheme pay to there, um, effectively replicate something very similar to open banking type payments um, as we have here in the UK. One of the best design schemes I've, I've seen, right? Like really, really kind of intelligently designed, kind of again, driven partly by regulation and partly by kind of commercial incentives. Um, and if you look at somewhere like the US, um, where everything is kind of very, very commercially driven and we're not quite there yet, um, but regulations are kind of coming in to kickstart some of that. Uh, and I'd be really intrigued to see how a more commercially driven market evolves over, over the next few years. So lots to play for, lots of interesting things happening. Um, and ultimately, I think you kind of need the carrot and the stick to make these things successful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely like that carrot and the stick analogy. Because, um, you know, if we look in here in the UK, you know, 
for example, like traditional incumbents like HSBC perhaps didn't have as competitive, you know, like money transfer uh, rates such as the WISE. And now you've seen HSBC bring out a whole new competitor um, to, to WISE purely from a consumer point of view and, you know, who was innovating better, who was offering better rates, better user experience, things like that. And, you know, that's been great for the consumer, pro-consumer that. But where we look at other scenarios, for example, like bank feeds and belonging to open banking, we haven't necessarily seen that because banks are, you know, as much as there's all these fields that they're supposed to share by open banking, they really only have to share the bare minimum to pass the, you know, acceptance checks. Um, so hopefully there's a bit more of a stick approach over there where needed and uh, we can get that along the line. Um, and I mean, now if we're looking a bit more forward into the future from an innovation perspective, Jordan, um, I know you shared with me a couple of weeks ago something really innovative that uh, DNA payments is going to be part of. Um, from I know you're traditionally known for the point of sale devices, you know, and everyone just thinks that means card. But um, I mean, you guys are going to be leveraging open banking yourselves. Um, is that something you can maybe share with us a bit today? Yeah, of, of course. Uh, one of the sort of our new updates will be that we'll have open banking on POS terminals. So I think we'll be the first, if not one of the first, to offer this for, for point of sale card machines. So it'll just, from our perspective and a consumer perspective, it allows us to be a, a lot more competitive in the payments market. It's from CMX point earlier, it's a lot more secure. So especially your high risk customers, it's going to be a lot, lot more secure for them to, to adopt that payment method. Okay. And how exactly is that going to work? Like, well, what would be the use case there? Maybe you can give an example to the users. Like, why would I want to open banking on a card terminal? Yeah. So, for example, a used car salesman, so where their transactions are quite not really high, but sort of looking around about the thousand pound, two thousand pound mark. So, rather than use a card payment machine in the traditional sense, you can adopt the, the open banking method and that lowers the risk of chargebacks. So basically, as a customer, you're not exposed to, to that amount being taken from your bank. So it, 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 there is a lot, a lot of benefits for it in that retrospect from a, a risk perspective. Cool, cool. Nah, super, super interesting. Um, I'm just conscious of the time here, so I'm going to move on to, uh, to the next topic at hand. So, Smack, maybe I'll hand that one over to you to, to run us through. Yeah, I mean, this this one is uh, one close to my heart. Um, I've, I've always been very, very interested in in how uh, different types of people like to pay um, and and what kind of what kind of drive some of those decisions. So we'd love to get a bit of insight from from both uh, both of you, Jared and Jordan, about um, how you think about your know, different uh, payment methods and how you actually offer and integrate them into your into your systems. Um, so maybe just start for ten. I mean, as a as a as a real simple one, how how do you think about multiple payment options uh, within you know your payment systems and how do they affect both cust both customer choice, but then ultimately their actual behavior as well? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's something yeah we think about quite a lot, John Kaleno. We've got like a lot of data points. Um, where we've seen these trends and, you know, where things are going. And I think, you know, often we, we've kind of got like two buckets of customers. Customers that come to us already a bit aware of like what's happening in the payment space, like Jordan, for example, where he's making use of direct debits, um, card payments, open banking is really, you know, they've got like the full suite of, of, of things. And what that means is that from a consumer's point of view is there's more ways to pick, pick their path and pay the way they want to. And from our own point of view, what we've seen, for example, is if you've only got one payment option available. So what do I mean by that? So like, say you've only got open banking available and you're not taking card payments. Um, if, as soon as you open up that additional um, payment gateway to for your consumers to pay or your customers to pay, you're looking at an increase of like 27% in payments almost overnight. And, that, and that's really, you know, instantaneous money in your bank, low effort from yourselves. Um, and from our point of view, you know, I think one thing's people one thing people get a bit scared of of having multiple payment gateways is like one you know how do they integrate am I going to get all that data across what are the capabilities at hand I think and you know from an integrations perspective um I think it's really key that you know from Kaleno's point of view for example we integrate with over nine different payment gateways so you can choose from a business point of view you know wherever you've negotiated the best rate from but it also means that your own customers get to uh, pay the best format for them at that point in time, because, you know, if you're on your phone and, you know, you might not want to go do a bank transfer or set up a direct debit, you might just want to pay with Apple Pay instantaneously. So there you're sitting on the couch, you're making that payment instantaneously. You're not forgetting about it until you get an nasty email saying, please pay me at a later stage. Um, 
And, you know, stuff like that, it's really, really important for our customers. And then, you know, likewise, we also look at the data that we're syncing across because from these different payment systems, can we get all that information that we need? Because if we can't, then, you know, we can't automate certain tasks for you. So I think that's also something to really keep in mind when you're looking at a payment provider. It's very easy to just say, oh, I'm going to go on the cheapest cost. And we've seen customers do that. But then what happens is, is that you don't get all that data. You have a worse experience. It's manual. Like you're missing out there completely on the, on the whole cycle. Yeah, super interesting. I, I especially like, I mean, you, you started with the, the point there of um, uh, you know, your, your overall number of customers that you can acquire going up. I, I remember uh, talking to a, a customer of ours uh, a, a few years ago, DocuSign, who experienced exactly that, right? Moved from a world of kind of cards plus a digital wallet, added a third payment option, which was uh, direct debit via Go Cardless. And yeah, all of a sudden they increased the total number of customers they were they were acquiring purely because, I mean, the you know, the, the obviousness here is that People are landing on your checkout page and then going, nah, you don't have the payment option that I like. I'm going to go elsewhere, right? Um, uh, Jordan, any, any anything you, you can add there from a, from your perspective as a, as a user as, or as a, as, a, as a merchant? Yeah, so of course, uh, DNA Payments is a, like a, an omni-channel platform, which basically means it's a, a central point for a lot of transactions. So if, even when it comes to a, a customer experience perspective, so you have a, a customer, say so you are a, generally online retailer customer but you have maybe quite a few stores so because that data is stored in a central point if a customer buys something online heads to an, the nearest store and says look I, I don't like this or it doesn't fit the the transaction information is still stored on your your post machines as well so because it's all linked you can see that they paid online. You can refund in person because now you've got the receipt of goods. So it's that time to serve and cost to serve as well. There's a, a lot of benefits in that in that retrospect. And with it all being a central data point, multiple payment providers, so whether that's ClearPay, Klarna, it, it's all in, interlinked into one database. Nice. Yeah, I think, I think that's huge as well for the consumer. I mean, I'm speaking from my own point of view many years ago in South Africa and you know, you're paying for something and then you want to go get a refund. And then they're like, well, we can only refund you cash or we don't have enough cash in the tool because you paid with cash or, you know, you paid with cards. So you have to have that card and then you don't have that card on you to get the refund. So I think that's really key for the customer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's super interesting. I, I, I think we've, we kind of focused on the, on the upside as to why you should kind of offer multiple payment methods um, and, uh, and, and, and be able to respond to that preference. Right. Um, but there are clearly going to be some clearly some challenges in doing that, right? Um, how, how do you think about some of those challenges that businesses face when they're you know first implementing multiple payment options in their systems, and then I guess secondly managing them on an, on an ongoing basis? Yeah, for sure. And I think you know maybe I kind of jumped ahead of it in my earlier point there, but I think you know integrations are key. Can you integrate that payment provider into other systems without having to go build the custom integration? You know. Um, Again, back to my earlier point, we've seen this with customers where, you know, Kaleno has nine different payment platforms. There's, there's hundreds of payment platforms out there. I think that's a, it's also something to be aware of where with the platforms that we use, simple sign-on and, you know, you're good to go. Single sign-on, API access. We get both all that information we need to charge your customers, but as well to automate all those payouts. Um, and I think customers very often forget that. They're like, oh, well, we've got the best rate. We're going to go with them but then you're using some type of backwards payment provider that no one's heard of and no one integrates with. So now what do you do with that? How do you even get that, you know, your best rate provider onto your online website, onto your shop, uh, you know, at your checkout, et cetera. So I think integrations are absolutely crit critical and key. Um, and then again, same as what I was mentioning earlier on is, you know, like what capabilities are you going to be getting out of this payment provider? You know, Great thing with GoCardless, you've got automatic charging, um, things like that. And Kaleno obviously helps assist, them, assist that. Um, and then number two is, again, you know, that data that's getting sent across. Because if you don't share all that information via pro, uh, payment providers, then you ca can't do half the processes. So I think really integrations, data points, and what capabilities are at hand are really critical when you make that decision and not just price. Yeah, yeah. And then and how, how, do, how, how do you think about... Um, you know, offering multiple payment methods in kind of a more international environment, right? Whether that's where you've got customers in different countries, you're looking at international transactions, you maybe have to factor in currency conversions, FX. Like how does that factor into, you know, make, I guess some of the challenges you might face? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think from our point of view, it's like, you know, take a payment provider that's 
uh, multinational or is it able to localize in that currency? You know, if you're selling into China, you need, you know, Alipay and WeChat, for example, you know, um, if you're selling into the US best, you're doing ACH. Um, so things like that are really critical, you know, localized to your market, but then as well as you don't want to be getting fleeced on those FX fees when you convert it out. Uh, so that's also something to consider, you know, like, cool, you're going to accept money in that country, but what's it going to cost you to get that money out of the country uh, is really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess, I guess, in order to kind of make some of those decisions, uh, it, it, you know, from a from a currency perspective, but also I guess some of the some of the points you raised earlier, um, uh, you you need access to data, right? You need to be able to understand kind of what's going on under the hood. Um, you know, talk a little bit about the role that I guess an analysis of that data might play in figuring out what the best mix is for you. Yeah, so I think you know there's a lot of smart work being done nowadays. You see everyone's throwing the word AI out there um, to really optimize, you know, the checkout conversion process for the customer. So for example, you know, it's, you know, there's enough stats and data out there to show that if you're buying certain goods, they're going to default to say a card, where if you're doing a larger payment, they might default to that open banking um, option. So I think, you know, there's a lot of data out there that's showing, you know, what's the most optimal way for you to pay and then suggesting that to your customer. Um, so I think that's very important from a payouts perspective. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, I think that uh, being able to choose how you optimize, depending on what you want to optimize for, right? Like, um, is it for, is it cost? Is it fraud? Is it, is it for the payer preference? Um, that's, uh, I think that's going to be, if you can do that with data, you're in a, in a much stronger position. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think, so we just uh, onto the next topic over here. To yeah. yeah we're, 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 we're at time now, right? Yeah. Yeah. We are all having a fat chat over here. We'll have to grab some beers later. <laughs> Um, so, um, Samak, I think this one's got to be for you direct debits resurgence as a key payment method in 2024. Um, you know, direct debits that we know have been around for a while, um, from Jordan's own perspective and ours, we've seen that, you know, why it's uptake and why, why, why it's becoming more popular, but, you know, maybe, you know, what's your opinion on, you know, what, what, why is direct debit making a comeback? Yeah, well, don't call it a comeback. I would, uh, I, I would argue it's been here for years. Um, so I, you know, is it really a resurgence? I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think I, my, my starting point would be that, um, in many markets, um, in many kind of with many demographics, in many types of uh, customer use cases, um, preferences, as we kind of talked about in the last question, super important, right? Um, and many people have a preference to pay with your bank account using bank debit, um, particularly for, you know, recurring payments, um, which, you know, which happen a lot. We, we know that preference is high for those, um, you know, payers like to use direct debit, particularly in those traditional recurring payments industries like energy, like telco, you know, you know a lot of people are used to it, um, you know, particularly in places like the UK, particularly in places like, like, uh, like Germany, but, you know, even places like the US, which we traditionally think of as being card heavy. So actually a lot of preference for, for these types of um, payments. Um, in specific industries. I think um, what one of the things that we've seen um, as well, combined with that kind of pre-existing preferences over the last, let's say, five to seven years, um, a kind of a, a switch or a, a, the rise of the subscription economy, right? So lots of businesses have kind of tweaked or changed or amended their business models to kind of become more recurring payment driven um and and therefore have had to then think about okay well what's the best way for me to to kind of respond to that switch um from a from a payments perspective um and and i think when you when you start when you need to take payments regularly um you know the 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 benefits of, of direct debit really start to come out right um you know you have really strong payment success rates um and you know and if you're switching from billing for something on a one-off basis to you know 12 times a year uh, me, being sure that each of those payments is going to be successful and go through is going to become really, really important. And if you can rely on, for example, that a bank account's not going to expire, expire, or that a bank account's not going to, you know, get lost, um, get get lost on an evening out in the back of a taxi somewhere, um, then you're, you know, you're you're, you're already at a, at a at a starting point. Especially when you consider things like payment success, or more specifically, payment failures are often heavily associated with churn rates, for example. Um, so you know, you've got that kind of payment success piece. Um, you've got, um, you've got the, uh, you've got a kind of a, 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 
in addition to that, you've got a, a, a big shift away from manual payments towards more automated pool payments. Um, so a lot of companies over the last you know, 10 years have decided to digitize their kind of, um, you know, their accounts receivable process, really try and kind of automate as much as you can. And if you're automating payments, moving away from, you know, sending out an invoice and just having somebody wire you some money or, you know, send you a check, for example, um, you know, looking at, okay, what are my options here? You've got card on file as an option, you know, maybe you can take digital wallet payments and, and automate those, but direct debits tend to be the best way of doing this, right? Again, you've got high payment success, ultimately low cost, um, you know, bank payments tend to be lower cost. Um, and, and, you know, those two things together kind of add up to a really interesting proposition. So what that then means is, is when you look at it, direct debit has gen genuinely been great for lots of payment use cases that have kind of taken off over the last five to seven years. Um, and the challenge has always been, well, how do you then just make it really easy for merchants who experience those pains and really want to kind of take advantage of it to get access to, 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 to direct debit. Uh, and so that's where kind of companies like GoCardless have come in over the last, well, well over a decade now to kind of make it really easy to, for small businesses and large businesses to get access to direct debit, to integrate it into their kind of systems of record and, and, and make it really simple for them to actually use. So I think the, to come back to your original question, then I think that the point would be that nothing's fundamentally changed about the underlying kind of technology. Um, but what's happened is more demand for recurring payments in a wider set of industries and then easier access to direct debit has led to a something of a resurgence. Cool, cool, interesting. Uh, Jordan, I think you had some more questions for us you mentioned. Yeah, so probably for, you, for yourself, CLX. So what would you say has been the sort of largest technological leap in the, the direct debit payment space? I think there's probably been a few, right? Um, so I think, as I said, the the first layer, I'd probably split it into a few layers, right? So I think layer one is probably kind of opening up access, making it easier to kind of integrate direct debit into, uh, you know, existing payment systems, systems of record, you know, this is where, you know, organizations like Kaleno are doing a great job where you can take something that's that's there and make it fit into kind of your workflow. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's kind of, you know, already a, a really important leap. I think um, uh, kind of at a layer up from that, um, you know, things that make it really easy for payers to actually interact and, and use direct debit have, have been like, you know, really interesting leaps as well. Um, you know, as an example, I'm sure many people on this call probably have at some point in their life filled out a direct debit mandate by hand on paper, right? Like writing out like name, address, account number, and so on. And just imagine A, the pain for you as a payer to do that, um, but B, um, just the number of errors that that, that, that that then causes. If you've made a mistake, you don't get told about it immediately you have to send it off wait till you come back and you know you're looking at weeks if there's a mistake before before anything can even get going so being able to do that in a digital way online you know with automatic checks in place um, i think that kind of is, a, is another leap that's kind of happened i think that if you then layer in additional things on top of that like um, you know can you verify the person's name to so make sure that it kind of matches the account number can you then layer in open banking on top to get them to um i don't know maybe verify that they own the bank account by logging into it and automatically kind of confirming it and then you know maybe then they trigger an initial payment out from their account in real time so that um you know you get a first payment instantly and then you set up a direct debit on the back end of that i think the combination of those things together are what's meaning that direct debit can be more and more applicable in more and more scenarios. Uh, and then, um, yeah, and then that's kind of what's, I think, the, uh, helping it kind of become much more popular. Yeah, and I, th I think from a technology perspective, um, you know, Jordan and I have both uh, co-worked, I should say, on a particular integration that will not be named. But um, from, you know, touching on that earlier point about what you should look at from a payment provider's point of view is integrations are key and API is key. And I think, you know, that one of the big reasons, at least from our point of view, that uh, we love working with GoCardless, and I would imagine this is also, you know, one of the many reasons why GoCardless has been so successful over the years, is that you're a modern APR framework that any technology company can integrate with, and not only can, but wants to integrate with. You know, it's a pleasure for our developers to integrate with it. It's easy. They can get the information that they want. You know, they're not having to build 100 manual processes for something that can be fairly automated because GoCardless is providing them all that information. So uh, for, for ourselves, I think, you know, that's why GoCardless has basically managed to leapfrog the traditional incumbents that have been around, you know, for like, 20, 30, 40 years um, is from a technology point of view is they brought that aspect of direct debit technology, you know, into the future um, in line with any other modern payments infrastructure. And really it's just a, you know, at the end of the day, it's another rail 
um, with its particular set of advantages, like, like you've mentioned. I, I was just about to say, so I, I know we've come a long way in terms of like sort of the payments experience and the payments sort of framework. But what what would be the next step for for the advancement in direct debit technology? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll have a stab at that. I think that um, I think about there being two interesting spaces. Um, I think the first is, uh, and we've started doing this at GoCardless a, a, a bit already, um, so, well, a lot already actually, but there's, there's more to come. It's how can you know companies like GoCardless, payment providers, um, leverage their information, their their intelligence, like all the data they have across the billions of you know pounds worth of transactions that they might that they might process to help improve parts of any payment process, right? So you know, as an example. Um, we we launched a product a couple of years ago, which we call um, Success Plus. Which, you know, if a direct debit payment does fail, it predicts the best time to you know retry that payment um, based on the uniqueness of a particular user. So it might say, actually, um, let's re let's try and recover from Jared on the first of March. Let's try and recover from Jordan on the fifth of March. And Simac won't have any of his money in his account for the next month, so don't even bother, right? Like, and then you can pick up your you know you can pick up your own your own flow from that based on everything we might know from you having you know. Um, you know, uh, process payments maybe for you for your electricity or something like that, uh, but also just like looking at everything uh, kind of across the board. So you can start to do some really interesting things with that type of the, that type of technology where you can predict things, you can look at fraud more more interestingly, and then also potentially start to kind of um, provide faster confirmation than you know direct debit typically allows. Because if you can predict success rates, you can predict fraud. Maybe you can kind of predict confirmation much more quickly as well. So I think on the one side, it's how do you use that information to be better than direct debit, basically, uh, and then on the other side, it's that we um that uh, go Carlos, we're we're really kind of um uh, big on the combination of open banking with direct debit, uh, and we think the two are quite complementary, um and and using them intelli in intelligent ways to to truly kind of create what we think would be a um, a true kind of competitor for cards in every respect, basically. Uh, interesting, um, and I think Jordan, you know, from your own point of view, as a uh, card provide you know point of sale the provider omni-channel payments provider but also a customer of go cardless um what has direct debits and go cardless's uh, impact on your own business been like if you could just talk us through that yes uh, from my perspective so i joined dna in so june 2022 so things were quite manual to be honest so we've so we had a previous direct debit provider who like you said, should not, should not be named because of how archaic and sort of legacy the system was. So we moved to, to go cardless for all of our subsidiaries in the DNA payments group. And it just allowed us to, to have a holistic approach to all our customers. So this is from an onboarding perspective. This it helps automate our accounts receivables as well. So with the integration with Kaleno, so that allowed us to automate all our direct debit runs across the group. So from our perspective, it allowed us to increase cash co cash collection, allowed us to forecast around what's going to be collected. So it was really great in that retrospect because everything became automated. And from a, a customer experience perspective as well, the customer knows where they are so that they know that their direct debit is going to be collected on their invoice due date. And they, they can predict and sort of build their cash flow around that as well. Cool, great. Um, well, I am mindful of time. I know we could be sitting here for another few hours. Um, so we're just going to jump into any questions. Uh, we'll give you guys a few minutes. Um, so if you don't mind just uh, putting some questions in the chat and uh, yeah, then we will uh, answer them from there. And then just to also give people a context of what's going to happen after this uh, while you're just, you know, jotting those questions down, um, you know, post the uh, webinar. Uh, everyone's going to get a copy of this recording and a blog summary via email. Um, please connect with us on LinkedIn for any follow-up questions. You know, you can reach out to any of us or anyone else in our teams and uh, ultimately hopefully book a demo with one of us to use one of our services. Um, but that's not why we're here today. We genuinely want to inform. Um, there is a lot of mystery out there with payments okay. and uh, we hopefully we simplify it for you. Um, so let's see, do we have any questions in the chat? Um, cool. Jay, I see you've raised your hand over there. I think you need to, um, are they allowed to talk? Okay, we can try that. Uh, you should Thank you, Jared. 
Yeah. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Shemek. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I'm an AR uh, consultant for uh, one of the bank processor here in the United States. Uh, one of the biggest challenge that I see is these ERP system out there. Uh, there are some integrated that we can play with. There are some just have their partnership with certain provider that make it harder into kind of the concept that we're talking about in sense of open banking. How, what do you see in your market, uh, in your area, and, and what are the things that you are doing in the future or in your roadmap to kind of make sure that, so that our client, our merchant have more option to choose from instead of, you know, tied in into a certain processor? Cool, good question. Who wants to take this smack, Jordan? Not so, so, Jordan, so let's go let's go Jordan you can have me so go for it it's, it's, well, it will, so we don't really work in the US market I was just about to say so probably not a question best for, for myself cool I'll, um, I'll I'll give it a go then so um yeah I think you know Kalena for example we try to be at the forefront of um payment technologies um you know there's obviously real-time payments in the states um and I think it's going back to what I originally said is offer people as many options as you can. Now you can overwhelm the customer. And then I think, you know, that's where the whole AI aspect coming in of like suggesting what is the most convenient way for you to pay. But I think ultimately, you know, being able to bring in different payment methods and not being tied into one particular uh, way of paying is really the most important thing. And then that's where systems like Kaleno come in of, you know, as many options as you can connect really. It's kind of limitless. Um, see, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, do you see chat GPT being used in payments in the next few years? Um, I think I'll take that one. So I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, you know, I think everything's going more towards that real time language processing and, you know, answering and language, natural languaging. And I'm pretty confident that, you know, in the not too foreseeable future, you're going to be on a website and it's going to say, you know, like, um, what do you want to do here? And you're just going to say, please pay all my invoices via card. Uh, not quite that simple. I'm sure. Uh, Samak's so got some uh, ideas around how the security process is going to work on that to make sure that uh, you're not being hacked. But I think, you know, topics like that, it's going to be very easy instead of you trying to navigate a UI um, or, you know, drill down and find those car details. I'm very confident, you know, whether it's a voice um, activation or just asking a chat bot on a website to pay, I I'm pretty sure there'll be something along those lines. Um, I see over here... Um, a lot, a lot of questions around AI, so the topic on everyone's hand. Um, I mean, I want to on, on those, maybe on those AI ones, because it's kind of linked to Chat GPT. I, I think there's, you know, a couple on this, and and, and you know, I, I would I would ask, um, uh, I would probably answer by saying, what makes you think it isn't already, right? Um, uh, you know, I, I I certainly talked about um, the use of uh, data and intelligence to make predictions about the best time to do things and the best thing. You know, we've talked about. Um, predicting the best time to kind of recover payments. We've talked about, um, you know, identifying fraud. We've also looked at, um, you know, what are the best payment options to present to any given user. Um, you know, AI has a massive role to play in in all of those things and to a degree does already, right? Um, so uh, I think it's it's more an iteration on those on those on those examples to get more specific to more to to more users to offer the best possible experience for those users. Um, so yeah. Um, Jordan, I think the last question is definitely aimed at you. Uh, do you expect scan on point of sale devices to prevail in the future versus card payments? So I would, but it really would depend on your, your business structure. So where, for example, you're a news agent, right, things are maybe fairly quick. You've got customers coming and going all, all the time. A quick contactless payment is probably best for you. Where, as to my example, as a used car salesman or maybe a a restaurant where things are, a lot, are going to take a bit more time, people are not in a rush. So I think it will lean towards like scanning a QR code on a, a POS machine, but it would depend on what sector. So from a hospitality perspective, especially you, you use car salesmen, I think we will get to a point because things will improve in terms of speed as well and, and cash being received. So I think the, the, the market will go towards that yeah. open POS. 
It's, it's, it's a really interesting topic because here yeah, it's very hot topic at hand, you know, the scanning of a point of sale device, etc. Um, but I was just chatting to um, our CTO, Ron, yesterday, and I come from South Africa, and you've been able to do that for over 10 years. Um, and it's a really great initiative where, you know, um, I think here yeah, you kind of saw it rise during COVID where there's not as many staff, say, in a restaurant, you go to the pub, you've got a QR code, you scan it, um, and you make the payment. But in South Africa, we kind of had that hybrid approach of that where you would go to a restaurant, you would pay, the waiter would just leave the bill at your table. They wouldn't have to come back with a card machine because there's a QR code on that. And then you can do a number of nifty tricks, you know, split it with your uh, friends at the table, apportionment, you know, tick which items are yours, for example. And these are all great concepts. And even in South Africa, I think there's a time and a place for, for both of them. Um, so I don't know if we'll see one prevail over the other. And like Jordan said, I think, you know, it's really going to be um, which method is most convenient and best for you. Um, one of the questions over here, you know, will there be an equivalent of open banking in the US? Um, well, I really hope so, because from a technology perspective, it'll be a lot easier. <laughs> um, so I've, been, I've got a little bit I can mention on that, but maybe Samak, if you, if you want to go. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I was I was just going to say, um, yeah, I, mean, I mean, yes. Um, I mean, we already see at, at the moment a lot of it's been driven from a market perspective, right? So you can already do a lot of things when it comes to um, accessing uh, people's bank accounts, pulling data from that, looking at transaction histories, balance uh, balance requests, all that sort of stuff. That's possible today. It's just not driven by regulation. It's driven by you know a few companies have have um, kind of led the way in. In, in opening up that access, at least from a private perspective, and then you know, kind of like uh, allowing others to plug into that. Um, but we're already starting to see the, 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 the names escape me now, but we're already starting to see kind of announcements of um, uh, kind of uh, laws coming in or regulations coming in, you know, towards the back end of this year and so on around like, how do we um, uh, encourage slash force, depending on your on your perspective, banks to kind of make it easier, for example, to share data between, from one bank account to another, make it easier to switch from one bank account to another and so on. That's the origination of, of kind of open banking. Uh, it's not too much of a leap from there. If you kind of combine those two things together, the, both the private and the and the um, and the kind of regulatory driven stuff to, to see a world where um, open banking develops relatively quickly in, in, in North America. But, you know, remains to be seen. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, even from our own perspective, uh, you know, when we say, is there an equivalent in the US, like, well, what are you hoping to get out of that? Payments, pull in your data. Um, for instance, Kaleno has been able to pull uh, banking information for the last couple of months. We built a feature out where we can pull real-time bank feeds in America um, for thousands of banks. And I think it's more of, you know, the technologies out there, it's just whether or not where you're using it. And, uh, you know, the systems that you have, are they able to make use of it? Are they going to still require manual bank feeds to be uploaded? Or can you put in a real-time bank feed like Kaleno can? And ours is, works the exact same way uh, that here in, the, in, in Europe, where, you know, simple single sign-on, connect your bank account, pull that information in, and then we can reconcile that information for you accordingly. Um, so I think there's still a lot to be done, but, you know, it's definitely making moves in that direction. I think we've kind of covered all the questions at hand over here. Cool. I think, I mean, Smack, Jordan, anything else that you guys want to add? Nothing from, from me, really. From a, a legislation perspective, obviously the, the UK is quite stringent in terms of open banking. Do you think legislation will become a bit more relaxed or do you think that, that there'll be ways from a technical technological perspective that we can still adhere to legislation, but that also serve customers as well from an open banking perspective. Um, well, I think we're going to leave it there then unless anyone else has got anything to add. Um, so, yeah, like I said, um, please, you know, we're going to be sharing this uh, recording after this via email and, you know, keep an eye on our LinkedIn. Of course, give us a follow, give us a like. Um, we will be uh, posting this video plus a whole lot more information. Um, and then ultimately, if you have any more questions, please just do drop us an email uh, or a LinkedIn uh, comment even, or send us a message uh, anywhere, any medium and uh, book a demo. And we can hopefully answer some questions for you, help you out and uh, ultimately get you paid faster. Um, cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, Ab. Thank you.